Thank you, and I hope I can live up to that, uh, to that introduction. And uh, wonderful, wonderful to be here. <coughs> My favorite city anywhere in the world, in spite of the weather that, we're, uh, that you're experiencing at this point in time. So, the hidden wealth of clients and customers. Uh, and I guess in the spirit of customer centricity, can you let me know when you want the lights turned? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> better. All right, fantastic. So, uh, so we'll do that. So, what are we talking about today? Then, really, I want to, I want us to talk and explore <coughs> what customer centricity really is. What does it mean? We'll touch a little as well on where the real value of an organisation lies. Talk also about the underlying platform for customer centric transformation. And then touch a little on the metrics in the business case that kind of sit behind the principles of customer centricity. You guys are okay with that? It's kind of on topic to make sure that we're uh, that we sort it out. So I'm going to kick off, if, uh, if I may, with a short video clip that just sets some context. Our world is undergoing rapid transformation in the economic, political, social, technological, and regulatory arenas. <coughs> New technologies relentlessly hurt the entire lives. Ideas and practices travel around the world at internet speed, and social media enables individuals to self-organize and reorganize in ways unimaginable just a few short years ago. In this time of change and upheaval, customers are stepping into their power and making demands of business the likes of which have never been seen before. Building sustainable competitive advantage, relevance, and resilience 
requires the capability to innovate the existing business model with a customer central to the design. Yet all too often, our thinking and our way of working are unable to deal with the transformation required, and our design process fails to cater for the criticality and complexity of customer centricity. Business model innovation through the lens of the customer rather than through the lens of the current business model is a must-have strategic imperative for the leaders of tomorrow. Business model innovation through the lens of the customer. And it's really about innovating new ways, finding new ways to create, to deliver, and to capture value. Customer centricity is a way of being, isn't it? If you think about a customer centric organization, there's something unique in its DNA. There's something unique in its genetic code. And it's that genetic code that determines the characteristics of how that organization behaves. A customer centric organization is designed around the very principles of authenticity, of humanity. Customer centric organizations have a strategy that kind of aligns the development and the delivery of products and services based on the current needs and the future needs of a select set of customers in order to improve the business performance of the firm. But it's not only the firm, it's to maximize value to society as a whole. Customer centricity is about an organizational operating model that allows or enables an organization to design and to deliver a unique and distinctive experience. And when I talk experience, I'm talking about a blend between the physical product or service and the emotions that are evoked when engaging with your organizations at any specific touch point. And this is all done in order to acquire, to retain, to develop targeted customers efficiently. We use the acronym REAP, retention, efficiency, acquisition, and penetration. And if you think about it, those are the only four drivers <coughs> that exist when it comes to looking to optimize or to maximize value of customer. We want to retain the customers that we have. We want to acquire customers out there of the right ilk, the right makeup. We want to be appropriately relevant in order to sell more to the customers that we have. And we want to do that in an effective way. And in the customer management world, efficiency is all about understanding cost to serve. How do we best deploy our resource, our funding, in the most effective way? Maybe we should consider redeploying our marketing budget at selected or specific groups of customers rather than unilaterally um, sharing the marketing budget and the marketing spend. Relationships that work are based on mutual interests. Relationships that fail are based on selfish interests. I mean, it's also screamingly obvious, isn't it? Customer centricity requires an alignment. It requires a company to be willing and to be able to change its organizational structure, to change its measures, to change employee and distributor incentives such that there's focus on maximizing longer term value. <coughs> In business itself is a, is, is a team sport, isn't it? It's kind of it's best when it's when it's shared. When it's shared between and across the stakeholder universe, if I can call it that. And I'd like to refer to uh, what, I, what I call the customer management illusion. There are a number of research studies that prove the radical misalignment that exists between an organization's perception of its customer centricity or customer centric capability and the perceptions of its customers. Typically today, five times as many chief executives believe their organizations are customer-centric relative to the number of customers 
or clients who agree with it. And in a recent study by the CMO Council, the Chief Marketing Officer Council, in excess of 50% of chief executives believed their organizations were extremely customer-centric. And I've got to ask you, I mean, what does extreme mean to you? On a scale of 0% indicating not at all customer-centric, and 100% indicating extremely customer-centric, I mean, that score, if we were able to score that, is 90% plus. Less than one-tenth of their customers agree. In an Accenture study, 75% of chief executives believe their organizations were customer-centric, as distinct from being extremely customer-centric. Yet 59% of customers expressed somewhat to extreme dissatisfaction with the level of customer service that they received. And that's an important point that I want to highlight, because customer service is not customer management. Customer service is not customer centricity. Customer service is not customer experience. Customer service is a result of having a customer centric culture or a customer centric organization. <coughs> Operationalizing a customer centric business is a complex issue. As a business, we work with organizations to facilitate their customer centric transformation such that they are able to create a differentiated position in the market and improve business performance. And I'm going to come back a little later to the complexity behind the uh, image that you see on the screen. But one of the steps that we undertake in working with these organizations is to assess the customer centric capability of the business itself. And I'll ask you a question. I mean, any guesses as to the average customer-centric capability score. In over 2,000 assessments that we've done around the world in multiple industries, we just shout out, how, 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 how customer-centric do you think the average organization is? Give me a percentage score. We've got a 30, 30 or 40, a 10, why are you being so, so harsh on the last of the day? I should say, why are you being so, 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 uh... so kind of 10, 30, 40, well, I don't hear, I don't hear any of you agreeing with, you know, the 50% of, uh, of, of chief execs who believe their organization scored 90%. It's interesting, what do you base that on? Do you base that on your own experiences in engaging with organizations? Or do you base it on, <coughs> Knowledge and insight of your own companies. A combination of. Right, well, you're kind of somewhere in the middle because the average score that we see is actually 37%. The lowest score that we've seen anywhere is actually 15%, which happened to be a mobile uh, telecommunications operator on the west coast of Africa. And the highest score we found anywhere in the world uh, is 75%. And that's an insurance company in Canada, Newfoundland, Canada, called Johnson Insurance. It's part of the Rolling Sun Alliance Group. So the disparity is huge. I mean, we haven't had the opportunity to work with the likes of an Amazon.com or a Zappos.com um, because those organizations fundamentally have the principles of customer centricity embedded you know, into, into their very DNA. So kind of with that as a departure point, my job today is really as provocative. I need to be the pebble <coughs> in, uh, in your shoe. I'm here to encourage you to think differently about business assets, to think differently about where the real value of your organization lies, and how best to optimize that value. And I'm here to, I'm here to reinforce that we can no longer view value in business from a single dimension of financial benefit. Because whilst physical assets and um, financial assets are currently measured and monitored very, very accurately, the same can't be said of intangible assets. And intangible assets are increasingly representing a higher percentage, a higher proportion 
of organization of aid. And we can't really just kind of look at these things under the traditional goodwill statement any longer. And it's been suggested that there are three kinds of intangible assets, one of which relates to competency-centered assets. Um, these are things like, like, like employee intellect. Uh, number of years that your professions have actually spent in, uh, in their profession. The existence of competency enhancing customers. Those customers that force us to kind of push the, the, the innovation boundaries um, in order to deliver something that is unique and different. Uh, this is about value add per employee. It's about diversity. It's about the number of professional people we have inside of our organizations. And then there's, then there's internal capabilities that we need to consider. Um, things like patents, concepts, business models, administration and, 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 and computer systems. Uh, the number of new processes that an organization is able to implement on an annual basis. The number of new products and services that the organization is able to bring uh, to market. Touches on culture, touches on spirit as well. And then we've got external uh, um, capabilities to consider as well. The ability of an organization to grow organically. The ability of an organization to attract uh, new customers. Um, customer relationships, knowledge of customers, brand equity, reputation, customer satisfaction. So, in the context of that, I want to refer to a research study that was conducted to try and determine where the real value of an organization actually lies. By analyzing and by classifying some key asset groupings that you can see on the screen, um, that hopefully take us above and beyond the traditional physical assets uh, and, 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 and financial reporting frameworks. One would think that for the purposes of business valuation, for the purposes of value driver understanding, um, for the purposes of business strategy inputs, uh, for the purposes of business and resource management uh, issues and focus, for the purposes of competitive advantage, for the purposes of competitive differentiation, um, we should take a broader base of assets into account, surely in considering where the organization value lies. So I ask you, I mean, who of you out there, when we look at this list of asset groupings, would agree with me when I say that the traditional financial frameworks of reporting physical and financial assets are somewhat inadequate in identifying where the real value of an organization lies? By show of hands. It's like about 35%. So for the rest of you, do you not agree or are you kind of neutral? You're indifferent at this point in time. Well, I hope as we move through this that, that I'm able to convince you um, otherwise. So this research sample, all of whom were senior executives, were asked to rate these 11 areas. They still listed alphabetically on your screen. Um, in terms of the strategic and financial importance of impacting on business performance and competitiveness. And the results were actually very, very interesting. Because the only assets, you know, that we currently measure and monitor accurately, namely the, the financial and physical assets, were not rated highly at all in terms of their contribution to financial uh, sustainability and to competitiveness. The number one asset base, uh, uh, you know, around, around the strategic contributor was intellectual property, which is essentially providing legal protection for our differentiators. Number two was customers. Customers were the number one financial contributor. Customers or customer capital. I mean, that, in most cases, is, is the primary source of, uh, of revenue. So, when we really understand how important the customer or the capital asset is to our organizational value, then I consider that we need to we need to be considering a new or a different game plan. And I want to add three further important points. 
Think for a moment about your stakeholder universe. I mean, modern organizations have kind of have five major stakeholder groups. You've got society, you've got partners, you've got investors, you've got employees, you've got customers. So my question is, is who of those, who of those stakeholder groups, if we maximize the value thereof, would benefit all of the other stakeholder groups? Clearly, okay. it's the customer, which kind of reinforces the need for us to use the principles of customer centricity in order to optimize value. We need, as, a, as, a, as an organization, to develop customer centric capabilities in order to maximize the value, to maximize the benefit for the rest of that stakeholder universe. Remember, we seek to become customer centric in order to differentiate ourselves. Customer centricity is going to allow us as an organization to stand head and shoulders above our competitors. Not only in terms of being unique and different, but in terms of business performance, sustainable business performance and business results. Number two, would you agree that customers contribute 100% and if not 100%, pretty damn close to 100% of all the value of our business? In most cases. Anybody that violently disagrees with me would not say that. It's customers and clients that create our value in each and every financial quarter. But they also create value in another way. And we refer to that as lifetime value. And lifetime value is the intention that the customer demonstrates in continuing to buy a product and utilize services from us in the future. And think about it. Lifetime value can go up and down in exactly the same way a share portfolio can go up and down. And that lifetime value can diminish. It can diminish as a result of a poor service interaction. That's bad news. It can also diminish as a result of a competitor introducing a far more compelling customer value proposition. The potential downward slide in that lifetime value, in almost all cases, is not understood, is not recognized by your companies. And it's certainly not reported to shareholders. Customer-centric organizations track the value of a select group of customers. So they are familiar, they are aware of a reduction or an increase in that lifetime value. And if we think about it, that reduction in lifetime value is akin to your organization's share price taking a knock as a direct result of you potentially reporting lower than expected earnings. I mean, there's even a formula for this, courtesy of Peppers and Rogers Group, a company that I worked for many years ago. It's, it's referred to as return on customer. And it's about the profit earned today plus the difference in that lifetime value <laughs> over the beginning lifetime. And my third point, I want to talk about deals with what the shareholders and investors really, really want. They want proof that leadership of the organization is able to grow the value of the business in the old-fashioned way, namely organically. They want confidence that leadership is able to acquire new customers, to get those customers to buy more from us to get those customers to utilize other of our products and services, to get those customers to stay with us. Because if, if leadership can do that, if leadership can add real value to customers, then we're going to be adding real value to shareholders at the same time. So surely, as a leadership team, as part of an organization, we are looking to maximize the value of each and every customer and each and every prospect. Because that is the source of our, our value. 
customers are the most unique, non-replicable, valuable, measurable resource that we have. And they're also a scarce resource. Why are they scarce? They're scarce because we can make a choice. So customers, therefore, are also, by the way, our biggest limitation on organizational growth. And acknowledging and understanding that customers are potentially limiting our growth certainly should have a massive impact on how we make decisions within our organizations. So back to, uh, back to that original image. How do we then, as, as organizations, transform our business? What approach do we need to be successful in building and operationalizing a customer-centric organization? Um, and the primary perspective, the primary point that I need to make here is that as an organization, we need to be viewing customer centricity customer management capability as a system, as a combination of interdependent parts, interdependent practices with very well-defined and understood capabilities across the organization. From a foundational perspective, from an enabling perspective, and from a tactical or from an execution perspective. And I'm going to take, take you through very quickly the logic that sits behind what it is that I'm talking about. And for any organization to become customer-centric, or if they're customer-centric already, to remain customer-centric, there's a requirement for enlightened leadership. Or if you're sitting in the audience and you are looking to run a customer-centric business or are running a customer-centric business, then I'm going to assume you are an enlightened leader. What is an enlightened leader? An enlightened leader, leader is, is, is somebody who recognizes that business model innovation is where the, the greatest opportunity is. In order to differentiate, we've got to find new ways to create value, new ways to deliver value, new ways to capture value. I love what's being, I, I, I love the, 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 the debate that this Uber is creating in the Cape Town area. I mean, it's disruption, it's disrupt, disruptive, isn't it? You know, that's the kind of thing we need to be thinking about. How do we create value in a new and distinctive way? It's also a leader's opportunity. In fact, it's the chief executive's primary, primary opportunity, primary purpose to create highly engaged employees. And this is where the culture, the people and culture element become hugely important. Because we want people within our organizations to be able to deliver this experience as a result of the culture, not as a result of a rule or a script. We start lacking that authenticity. We start lacking that empathy. We start lacking that humanity. And in today's world, of course, it's all about technology and systems. We've got to have the most appropriate technology and systems in place. We've got to have the data. We've got to be able to mine that data. Because as a result of mining that data, we're able then to generate insights. And it's those insights that can help us in planning our strategies and planning our implementation programs. Those plans need to be aligned with our brand value, our brand promise. It's as a result of the insights that we talk about that we can then create propositions that are appropriate. We can create propositions that are relevant. And our go-to-market model then is through the appropriate channels and through the appropriate media. And somewhere in that journey, as a business, if we're looking to be customer-centric, we're going to be delivering a unique and distinctive experience. Maybe at a particular touch point. As a business, we need what I refer to as strategic agility. You know, most organizations today, as they move beyond the startup phase, are optimized for efficiency rather than for strategic agility. And strategic agility deals with the, with the ability of the organization to maximize opportunities, to dodge threats with speed and with assurance. And then, as I indicated earlier, it's about a different set of measures. Doesn't mean we discard any of the operational measures that we need to uh, we need to deliver on, but it's about introducing a different set of measures. And those foundational capabilities and those enabling capabilities allow us to perform much better in those customer value management drivers that I referred to. So we'll be better able to design and deliver 
distinctive retention-based initiatives and capabilities. We're more appealing in terms of gathering new customers. We're more relevant and we're more appropriate in the offerings that we bring to market for our existing customers. And we're operating our business with a sense of customer asset optimization in the efficiency side. There's no such thing, ladies and gents, as an average customer. I mean, who's average in this room? By show of hands, please. Do you, do you perceive yourself to be average? You know, there's a study done in the US. 90% of US citizens believe that they were better looking than, than anybody else. Um, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so, so we've got some logic around the system behind this transformation journey that I talk about. Um, in any transformation journey, we've got to be absolutely clear as to our point of departure. You agree with me? So, so as we're trying to build a customer centric organization, we need to have an objective, quantified, and hopefully benchmark understanding of how capable we are as a business in maximizing customer profitability. That's where we start off with. We've also got to be pretty crystal clear about the destination. You see, I'm not sure how many of you actually work in a customer-centric transformational field, but customer centricity is not a one-size-fits-all. Customer-centric for you and your organization, uh, for you and your organization, and you and your organization, and Amazon and South African Airways and heaven forbid who else, um, doesn't mean the same thing. So for leadership teams who are looking to deliver and embark on this customer-centric mission, involves discussion, stimulating, structuring, driving the thinking of those teams to determine what this thing means to the organization. What value is the organization expecting to get from customers? Because it's an investment and it's a painful transition. It also means understanding the gap that exists between statements that are often made by, by leaders. Um, so often, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't know whether you would agree 100% with me, but I'll pick up a, a set of financial statements. And there's, in most cases, some commentary about, you know, we're a customer-centered enterprise, or, or customer's king, or customer focus is one of our big strategic uh, themes. But when you drill into it, there's nothing behind those statements. So when we start defining what the future needs to look like, we've got to understand the gap between what we're saying versus the planning, process change, behavior change, system change that needs to exist in the organization for us to, to drive that transformation. I have yet to come across an organization that says to me, I don't want to be customer centric. Now, no doubt, there are some organizations that should be doing it. Do you guys believe Apple is a customer centric business? So, by show of hands, yes, you said yes. Okay, so did the rest of you said no. Okay, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting discussion because Apple to me is not customer centric. Is Starbucks customer centric? Okay, really interesting. Because to me, Starbucks is not customer centric. Let me explain by what I mean. <coughs> Apple is out and out a product centric business, and they need in the market space through the delivery of probably one of the best intuitively engaging products that we've seen in the last decade. In fact, the last multiple decades. Why do I have the audacity to say that they're not customer centric? Well, you walk into any Apple store anywhere in the world, you'll have a great experience, but they don't know who the hell you are. Customer's interest is about knowing and understanding who your customer is. So when they get to the point of having a system, that when you walk in and you identify yourself, and they're able to track and understand and know exactly how many Apple products you've bought, and where you bought those products, and how satisfied you are with them, and, 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 and then they're going to be a customer centric business. Howard Schultz in the Starbuck world, is dealing with this issue as we speak. Because your local Starbucks outlet is no doubt customer centric because you can walk in there and sell at the usual things. You know the barista, you know the people, you know the environment. 
Well, when you cross borders or go to a different country and you walk in, you can't walk in and say, I have the usual keys. It's a completely different experience. So the issue and the challenge for organizations who are looking to follow that model now is to, is to share that insight, to share that information, to make it accessible at all of the, all of the various points of, of contact. So, so back to what I was talking about. We intuitively know and understand that customer centricity is, the, is, in most cases, not in all cases, the right thing to do. Um, but in an organization, if we can't deliver fair and sustainable business performance all the time, then this whole customer centric transformation initiative is going to lose traction. It's not going to happen. You know, we're still going to deliver product uh, profits by next Thursday. And customer centricity calls for a more sustainable approach over a period of time. The minute that we start missing our profit targets, many organizations then kind of defer back, you know, to the slash and burn cost cutting and, and what so often happens, initiatives that uh, potentially damage brand reputation, brand royalty, and such like. So, We've got a fairly good understanding of, of how current, uh, our level of current uh, uh, customer management profitability capability is, a fairly good idea of where we want to go, and, 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 and kind of we understand this importance of, of ongoing performance. The question then is really, well, if we're going to consider business performance through the, through the customer-centric lens, um, surely we need to start thinking about measures that underpin those four drivers of customer value that I spoke about. So I'm, I'm showing you in this template uh, an appropriate approach. And what we have sitting down the left-hand side here is really a bunch of value segments. Really high value, high value, medium value, low value, marginals, loss makers, etc. And, and for the purposes of this exercise, I've taken an average spend per year in that particular segment. And what we have across the top are a very generic set of measures that speak to each of those value drivers. And, and, and the trick and the challenge here in your organizations is for you to identify the measures that are most appropriate to your company and to yours. Maybe if it's in the top of space, we're not talking about lost customers, we're talking about churn. It, it really doesn't matter. But, but for the purposes here, I'm saying, you know, retention uh, is measured by lost customers, it's measured by customers going dormant. Efficiency is measured by cost of acquisition and cost to serve. I don't like cost of acquisition. Quite frankly, I prefer value per acquisition, but that's another story. Um, acquisition, number of new customers per year, number of customers that we want back. Penetration of development relates to core usage revenues. It relates to number of products per customer. So how would this pan out in an organization? Um, so we take I use an acquisition example here. You take number of customers in each of these value bands that are required per year. We look at the average value. I mean, that calculation quite simply is calculated by, by multiplying that number by that number down the line and then dividing by the total number of customers. So if we're managing the business, we're hoping to increase that value. The same holds true for customers that we want back. And what we have here at the bottom is the contribution, the revenue contribution as a result of those new customers. And this is what's important when we start thinking customer centricity, because when we start thinking along a process like this, we then understand the value contribution that's generated by new customers for you. We're able to understand the value contribution generated by the existing customers that we had at the beginning of the year that we still have. We're able to understand the revenue and the profit contribution generated as a result of the customers that we do have utilizing more of our products and utilizing more of our services. And we're able to optimize our profitability by deploying our resources, by deploying our, our additional dollars, or reallocating our initial uh, our, our additional dollars to areas that we believe are going to give us a greater return on investment. Okay, we do exactly the same thing for efficiency. And yet again, and you'll see in this case, in this certified, in this segment, you recognize that to acquire these high value customers actually costs us a bit more. We find them in a different place. And we total these things at the bottom. $5.1 million 
acquisition cost, 6.2, 6.9 million dollars cost to serve. Um, and we would do exactly the same analysis for retention uh, and for penetration. And don't worry about trying to map these numbers. I mean, these are sanitized numbers. I'm just really showing and sharing with you the principles. But the question now is going to be, okay, so we've got this stuff, so what? The real question is, from a transformation perspective is, what do we do with this? Because this, this is representative of our current organizational capability as it stands today. As a business now, we're going to be sitting there and saying, can we estimate the realistic financial uplift if we improve these things? So if I diminish at the very high value level, if I'm able to retain 10 additional customers, what does that translate to at the bottom of the, bottom of the, 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 the curve? And we go through a process like that where we look to optimize our acquisition mix. You know, if, if we're that much more effective as a result of an organizational improvements in capability, then we're able to acquire more of the kind of customers that we're looking to acquire, aren't we? Because we understand them, we know where they are, we know what appeals to them, we can be relevant to them, we, become a, we can become a whole lot more targeted. If we understand why customers are staying with us, we can utilize those learnings in order to improve our retention. So we land up building this business case that motivates and justifies to our, our fellow uh, um, senior colleagues and to the board as to why we need to be moving forward and why we need to be investing in the underlying foundational capabilities of the organization. And if we then take the costs associated with that transformation, then we're able to build our ROI. Make sense? So, again, if you understand how capable we are, we know where we're going, we have an underlying business case that motivates why we should be driving this differentiated behavior, then we're sure we're in a far better place to understand those interdependencies. We're in a far better place enable, to enable us to roll out an implementation plan that has that much more chance of success. There's a very, very strong correlation between, between business performance and customer-centric capability. Um, companies can generally expect a 400% return on investment from well-managed customer management programs. The benefit of the payback period is directly linked to the level of maturity of an organization. It also relates to the investment needed within uh, within that organization. And, and less mature and less capable organizations are going to need to invest in it. It's going to take a little longer to generate those returns. Um, it might be a little bit more risky. But I want to refer to what I said earlier as well. Most benefit, if any of you are involved in this transformational, uh, customer-centric transformational journey, most benefit is gained by viewing customer management as a system, by viewing it as a value chain. And this is because the compounded benefits of action across the business um, will lead to a scale of benefit that individual activities won't. So what do I mean by that? Um, as an example, uh, it's, it, there's a little sense in having highly, highly motivated employees with very clear objectives managing customers who are making a roster. Think about the traditional key account management systems. They may well be contributing lots of revenue, but they're costing us a hell of a lot to serve. You know, equally so, there's no point in having an excellent IT system if the data that we bring into that system is not, uh, is not of an appropriate quality. Or if people don't understand how to use that system. Or if using the system <coughs> doesn't deliver the appropriate experience. Uh, there's less value in lead management or managing inquiries really well if our targeting program is so that's what I mean uh, about looking at this from a systems perspective. So, um, at this stage of the game, let me open this up to, to questions and to discussion. So I'll turn these lights. Interactive session, folks. 
post some of your challenges, share some of your challenges, share some of your observations. What does this mean to you? Is it a is it a, a, a impractical from your perspective? I think the average dairy farmer knows more about his business than the average business out there today. And the customer today is nothing else but a dairy car for most businesses. I love that analogy. Can I steal it? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's awesome. So, so, so I mean, just expand on that. Us. Hmm? Exactly what you've been telling us. So you knew it already and you wasted coming and you wasted your time coming back. <laughs> this one, no, I'm not mad. You don't have no counters yet, so. <laughs> so I mean, build, a, build on that a little. I mean, personal experience is uh, any difference when it comes to the organization delivering service to you? Is it not because people don't believe this world customers are rich, right? And linking up with the previous speaker was saying that is why you just want to work as much as possible. You don't understand the concept of, of the life cycle of the customer and the customer with Our best customer experience at the moment comes from an app from um, my internet service provider, Afrihost. And it's amazing how they use technology to create personal relationship. And it's amazing how they keep me in the loop of whatever is happening at the company. And it's amazing how they manage to use technology to generate at least a perception of customer value. If I only use 13 gigabyte of data per month, but they give me 26 I'm not going to be using 26 because I'm sort of used to using 13, so it's not going to cost them anything. But I get a lot of those all the time. And I've never seen them advertise because I'm the advertisement. Fantastic, and you're sharing that here. Yeah? And clearly, you don't have kids, you've just got cows because 13 yeah. gigs is not enough. <laughs> <laughs>
got ten times more profits tomorrow. Uh, you know, so so absolutely, but it, it, it calls for the vision of a leader to anticipate a future beyond next Thursday. You know, which is when we're going to deliver our our profits. I think we should also consider why the client needs our product. Um, does he buy it because it satisfies his own needs? Or is it the purchase of, I have to buy this? In our industry, in the security industry, um, a lot of purchases is almost a grudge buy. I, I can't really afford it, uh, but I need to have it. And that's a very interesting uh, sales scenario as well. So in that world, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it, is it OK um, not to be customer centric? And I'm making a very general statement. But is it okay not to be customer centric? And and aligned with that question is that well then how do you compete with your competitor? I think you have to be a, a fair amount of dedicated to the client what he actually requires to meet the expectations. So how's that different from a competitor? Well, you can sell if uh, competitors can sell substandard systems. Can they might admit that. Maybe, no. maybe they don't. No. So, if, so let's assume that uh, uh, playing fields are there. How do you compete? The difference is trust. So security, security is based on trust. So companies are like you, what you can measure trust is from the client towards the company. Okay, so how, how, how are you customers? Are you going to. And I'm seeing you and I'm seeing your competitor. Are you going to sell me on trust? Many people uh, trust is built by experience. So the longer the company's been in operation and the bigger the client is, is generally the way people who do security company decide to do some business. Um, but it requires more innovation. And especially that industry requires innovation. The problem with, with security is that in many cases that is broken by another individual. You, you generally work through. A, 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 there's a subject between you and the client. So in, in, in many cases, there's an employee that makes decisions for a number of people. <coughs> whether that be on a, a housing safety, whether that be for a technological service. And the decisions made by that individual affects the customer's uh, so experience or their perception of that. <coughs> I mean, you're in, a, you're in an industry that's undifferentiated. The question, of course, the secret source is, well, how do you differentiate? You know, at what point in the customer journey, you know, as I'm engaging with you, whether it be through my estate management or individually, um, you know, where, where are you, you looking to be uniquely different? Uh, and, and where you are looking to be uniquely different needs to be at the point um, around which I believe there's an opportunity for differentiation. I very often use uh, progressive insurance, unfortunately, it's a US based organization as an example there. Um, because if you think about the traditional customer journey, I mean, everybody goes through the same process. But quite frankly, I'm not looking for an above average experience in signing my policy document. All right? I mean, that can be average. It doesn't matter. It's not important. But what is important is the claim process. So, in progressive insurance case, for argument's sake, which we've done really well in South Africa, is they they actually invested in a fleet of vehicles. So the claims assessor used to go out to the scene of the accident and would assess the damage and very often um, reimbursement would take place electronically from that point in time. That's one benefit and that's a massive benefit. But the other benefit was is that as a result of having that vehicle on site for the client, that becomes a sanctum. It becomes a cocoon. Very often accidents are stressful events. And if you think about South Africa, particularly so, because you've got 987,000 tow truck operators that arrive when you have an accident. <laughs> so, so you would be then able you know, to get into the, into, into the assessor's vehicle where you can make a call to your family you know, and, and, and just kind of stabilize yourself. Now, you know, there's an area of differentiation. And you can capitalize on it. There are many other uh, benefits that they have as well, you know, that related to you know, where your car was at any point in time, how, how much you were using it. I always use the example because I used to travel extensively. My car sits in the garage. 
for half of his life. Now, and what's insurance for? You know, car being stolen, it's in a gated estate, it's in a, in a, in a, in a, in a locked up house, unlikely it's going to be stolen. Um, accident damage, well, unless my kids use it to rent the skateboards off the side of it, it's not going to be damaged. <laughs> you know, so, so, so align my, my <coughs> monthly premium with your risk as an insurer. Insurance company. So you know, again, a disruptive business model that speaks that speaks to us. So there's a story. You say, oh, I, you know what? I always look for the organisations. I look for the story. What do you stand for? What do you stand against? Metro Bank is a great example in the UK. Do any of you know Metro Bank? Okay, New High Street, relatively New High Street Bank, first banking license that was issued since the days of Queen Victoria. So, so Metro Bank focuses itself around customer experience, customer convenience. So how do they bring that alive in the business model? Well, what they do is they open from 8 to 8, Monday to Friday. But it's not actually 8 to 8, it's 10 to 8. Because you'll know if you're in London, you stop outside of a bank at 8 o'clock and the guy's sitting there with the keys to try and open the door, you know, and kind of walk in and turn on the computer system. They're ready. They're operational by 8 o'clock. They're open from, from 8 to 4 on a Saturday, they're open from 11 to 4 on a Sunday. Convenient. They can issue, they can open an account, issue a checkbook, issue a, a credit card, issue a debit card, um, activate them within 15 minutes. In fact, they only need 7 minutes, but they can do it in 15 minutes. They're dog friendly. The palms don't walk in their dogs. So they come in, there's, you know, there's, there's dog bowls, there's water bowls, if the dog makes a mess, it's not the end of the world. Um, apparently the ponds also like uh, walking around with lots of change, so they have money counting machines. Now these things cost 40,000 pounds a piece. You don't have to be a, a metro bank client to use their money counting machines. So they bring it alive that way. Um, and that's what they stand for. But for me the interesting thing is what do they stand against? Well they stand against stupid bank rules. So, you know, that proposition, I don't know about you, and if there are any bankers in the audience I apologize for fishing, but Banking rules suck. So, you know, we've got to think about these things. You, you, you were raising issues around uh, trust and, 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 uh, and, and, and other parties involved in the, in the security sale. You know, there's also regulation and compliance. We have to adhere to those things. But businesses can, they can, they can package that message in a more effective way. If I'm challenging regulation or compliance, don't turn around and say to me, well, you have to do it because that's the law. Rika, Rika, whatever else it may be. We can make, we can justify why some of these things need to happen. Make us feel a little better, a little more better about it. So I'm always looking for this, for this conflicting story, one that creates a level of tension, one that, 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 that people can build on. I mean, that's what creates word of mouth. Otherwise, you just need to. Incrementalism, you know, better sameness. Let's go around and do exactly the same thing that we've always done in the past. Let's do exactly the same thing that our competitors do, and let's do wonder why nobody takes any notice of what it is. We're boring, come on, you know. That's why I love you, yeah. uh, Just a very simplified example of customer centricity that I've learned today, or that I have yet to have. We have this brilliant initiative of handing out uh, cups of instant coffee in trust. Um, I think there's a very special particular way. <coughs> um, it's, it's great, it looks like it's customer focus, etc. The real difference between that and a real customer service, uh, customer centricity, would be a no extra cost to walk around with, would you like coffee and tea? And have actually have, instead of giving them coffee, of giving them the option, would you like coffee and tea? It would make no difference in cost, but that would create the impression or the reality of the, that they have the choice. Like chicken and beef. Did you change the label? Did you change the label? Did you change the label? It tastes exactly the same. The same that we just charge for. Yeah. It's an experience, isn't it? That's unique. My question is around customers. So I understand it constantly. Are there levels that you go through when you grow companies? You can't spend the huge amount of you know, 
So I mean, it's a really, it's a really interesting discussion. And if you think about it for the, for the last uh, century, 99% you know, of organisations have made their profits to be product centric. Um, and there might, there, there might be nothing wrong with being product centric. I mean, in a product centric world, everything is about the product. So you know, we we reward people based on the ability to create product and sell product. Um, we generate our, our profit through volume and growth. And, and, and volume and growth are derived by extending into new territories uh, or developing new products and convincing customers that version 2.0 is that much better than version 1.0. Um, you know, so, so product centric is the way that businesses have done this <coughs> for many, many years. But in the last 10 to 15 years, things have changed. And technology is brought around that change. So monetization takes place so much, so much more quickly. Um, Customers are, 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 are way more informed. Uh, globalization, regulation, deregulation, remove competitive barriers. We can get products from everywhere. So, so cracks have started appearing in the product center model. But it doesn't mean that that doesn't have a place in business. I mean, you can't argue with Apple's results. Uh, what we can argue with is to whether they're customer centric or not, and that's fine. That's a different discussion. So getting, getting back to your point, the question is, is can, can we have a hybrid where we are product centric in the way we go to market and customer centric in the way we go to market? And that invariably is the starting point because if you really start interrogating customer centricity, it's about, it's about aligning your product development and delivery around the needs of, of around the current and the future needs of a select set of customers. And those generally are those customers who have a higher lifetime value. Um, and I always say, as part of this transformational process, one of the ways of getting the momentum built, I've shared some ideas around the business case, but one of the ways of getting the momentum built is to take a group of customers and you put them under management. You start treating them differently because people want to be treated differently. You invest differently in them. You engage with them differently. And you build that business case to determine what the level of uptake is, you know, what the level of retention might be, and, 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 and. Um, and that's very much an evolutionary process. Now, the business model may be one that only provides true customer centricity to a, a select group of your customers, and not so much on the other, because we need that critical mass. You know, it's like, it's like your investment portfolio. You've got cash and bonds and all of these kind of low-risk uh, uh, assets that you need to have there. But the real return you're going to generate from the high risk side, the real return, the real loss, um, you know, and the same, the same kind of holds true if you think about customer centricity inside of an organisation. Is it difficult then for small businesses when they you start off with your customers and they generally your customers just go with the side of the and at some point you're going to say, I'm going to do small for my business. Doesn't that happen to the man? Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, think about a local company, Yuppie Chef, um, Paul Galatis. Uh, when they when they started Yuppie Chef, you know, they started handwriting those notes that you get with your order together with your little badge and whatever else that you get. Who, who, who buys stuff from Yuppie Chef? Okay, well, for those of you who don't, go and try it because it's such a great experience. Um, and, 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 and when, when Yuppie Chef got investment uh, capital coming into that, the story I'm told is that one of the one of the potential investors said, or somebody who was looking to get involved in the business said that you're not you realise that when that when you scale, you're not going to be able to keep up this personal touch. And and, and Paul and his fellow colleagues said no, that's that's we are always going to do that. And they've now got a team of nine or ten people who kind of handwrite these notes, you know. Um, so they maintain that through the scale process. The other point that you that you make mention around small businesses is that small businesses in most cases are intuitively customer centric because you know your customers. Somebody said to me the other day, well, give me an example of a 100% of a customer centric business. If you, if you were a, a, a fund manager, an individual wealth generator, financial advisor, whatever it may be, and you had four billionaire clients, that's all you had. You would probably be very customer centric because you know exactly, you would know absolutely everything about every one of those, those people. 
So, you know, it, it's, lit, it, it's really a, a hybrid process. But there's no doubt that from a sustainability perspective, from an earnings perspective, a customer-centric business model is where huge opportunity lies. Um, just based on your, your research there, and um, the comments that have been made, it's, it seems quite common that, uh, call it the uh, executive uh, members of an organization, especially a mature organization, have a perception that yes, they are customer centric, but the real fact is it is in fact not so. I and mean, most organizations probably have a sales team or marketing team uh, out there who have customer obsession and they, they have a frustration that their ex go do not understand this part. They can see how the business is sort of drifting away or the support towards a different uh, way of applying for the sales budget is not happening. And we've got a quick uh, tip or a quick sell that a mature um, ex can be shocked to reality that this is what will make the future go. I mean, there's two points there, and that's uh, so common. Um, the issue, again, comes back to systems based thinking. So you've got to look at the only way you can ever design and deliver a unique experience is if you've got organization. Functional areas where you can, um, and that's and that's a critical issue. Without an enlightened leader, who kind of gets the stuff. Okay. You know, I would be the class today, and I can see that the guy, you know, it, it's, it's kind of lips, lip talk. Um, it's it's really not worth going any further. You know, you can you can put the lipstick on a pig, but it's never going to not be ugly. So so those are the realities. The other reality then deals with, with some of the business case issues that we speak about. So it's a uh, it's not a really issue. issue. Anyway, I can I deal with you afterwards because I think I think we want to wrap up and I just I, I just want to maybe it's a short question. Maybe let's take that as the last question. Okay, I wanted to ask about South Africa in particular. How customer centric are we compared to the world? I mean, did did customer centricity originate perhaps in America with the consumerism there? Or where, where did it originate from? If you could sort of pinpoint an area and how has it penetrated into South Africa? How far along are we? Okay. So, I think mean, very broad based question, very interesting question. Your customer centricity has been around for hundreds of years. You know, I can share all sorts of examples of Tuyama and Makasui, which you know, deals with medicine provider provision in Japan and South Africa. Um, the issue is, is that South Africa is, uh, as other areas of the world, um, demonstrates islands of excellence. You know, I mean, we have organizations here that are very customer centric in certain of the areas. So, uh, Avis, you know, point to point, customer centric organization, they've never been late, they provide a service, certainly for me. Um, you know, that's a, that's a consistent, reliable experience. They don't wow me, but I don't want to be wowed. I'm wowed by the fact that they regularly arrive on time. It's all I'm looking for. You know, don't, don't wow me by arriving 10 minutes earlier and then the next time you come and pick them up half an hour late. That's not consistency of experience. So, most, so what we find in most organizations is these islands of excellence. The challenge facing organizations is how do you bring this stuff together? Um, so we start talking about the likes of examples.com or Amazon.com um, or whatever it may be. So I don't think we can say that South Africa is less or better in the overall scale of things. We have some challenges and we have some challenges of the past and I always raise this issue um, because we all know we're all told that we need to be hiring for attitude rather than skill. Yet we still defer to skill. In order to reduce the, the, the balances of the past, um, we also now need to consider color into, in, into that dynamics. So, so the attitude or concept now is, is one layer or one level even further you know, that, we've, that, that we've got to consider. But fortunately, um, I think as a, as, a, as, a, as a population, as a culture, there's an intuitive Willingness to provide a good service. I mean, I think back to 2010 World Cup. Um, but we're also, I, I guess, overwhelmed in some cases by by self entitlement, you know. Uh, and, and we've got to manage those things. So, you know, that kind of gives you a different perspective on your question. Okay. So let me bring it to conclusion then, uh, if I may. And thanks so much for the discussion. Thanks so much for your attention. <coughs> thanks so much for being here. Every day. You and I make many decisions that kind of mark our place in the universe as, as individuals. In our business lives, though, the collective decisions 
made our organizations tell a different kind of story to our customers and our employees and the market space about what it is that we value, what it is that we care about, how much we consider the other person on the other side of the decision we make, how committed we are to delivering against our brand promise, how we deal with problems and how we deal um, with challenges. You know that in these days of social media, you are only able to influence 22% of the buying decision. A full 78% of that buying decision is influenced and made by customers listening to one another, listening to their experiences, listening to how it was that they were treated. And companies that grow by moving in the direction of their employees and their customers become immune to competition. Customers themselves, you and I, aren't afraid to tell other customers about our experiences. We're not, we're not afraid to recommend um, companies that we do to other customers. But in closing, there's one category. And that is that you've got to earn the right for those customers to tell that story in the first place. So on that note, ladies and gents, thank you so much. Um, I have a round for a couple of minutes if you want to uh, talk further. Well, thanks. Welcome to the business school. I think a couple of things that I've learned this morning, and I think that the people in the audience have learned this stuff, I think that one realizes that the customers are asset. I think in your closing, Comments where he was saying that we, the customers become a brand advocate. I was listening this morning when the dairy farmer was mentioning about AfriHost, where he was referring actually AfriHost to you and you made the decision as well. I think those are the principles of customer centricity that we must realize. I think again as well this morning when we heard about the financial importance and the strategic importance, coming back to some of the questions that we've listened to this morning as well, is that in board meetings, people are scared of making and talking about this principle because it's not the exact science. And I think because it's not the exact science, people will always default back to what they are known and prone to and that they can make decisions on. But the people that is in that field, you guys that sit around the table, it's you that needs to go out and also talk about the principles and the system thinking in customer centricity that will take it further. Doug, thanks very much for your insight and we really appreciate it.